I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas About Radical Orthodoxy. Ten years ago when I was studying, nobody really thought theology was an important subject. It seemed to be something one did if one was a rather, rather marginal person. But now theology is a subject increasingly popular. You can scarcely open a newspaper without some reference to it. And it does seem to me that quite suddenly theology is becoming important in a way that it wasn't before. Theology was once called the queen of the sciences. In the age of faith, knowledge of God was considered the fulcrum of all knowledge. Then theology lost its proud place. In the modern world, reason stepped to center stage, and the truth of things was sought without reference to God. But today, in what some call post-modernity, things are different. Modern certainties have been shattered. Reason has lost its confidence, and philosophy has stumbled into the dark wood of language, where words point only at other words. These circumstances present a new opening for theology, according to the theologians of a movement called Radical Orthodoxy. Today on Ideas, we have two of the founders and inspirers of Radical Orthodoxy, John Milbank and Catherine Pickstock. Their ideas are presented by David Cayley. What came to be called Radical Orthodoxy first announced itself in 1990, when theologian John Milbank published Theology and Social Theory, Beyond Secular Reason. It's a long book, full of intricate argument and dazzling rhetorical bravura, but it also conveys something of the urgency and confidence of a manifesto. Milbank's central argument is that modern social and political thought rests on no better or more secure foundation than Christian theology. Both are stories about how things are, and as such, they stand on the same footing. But Christian theology, Milbank says, out-narrates modern thought, because it has a better and a truer story to tell. It's a bold claim. And when I interviewed John Milbank recently at his home in Southall, an old cathedral town near the University of Nottingham, where he currently teaches, I asked first about the roots of the confidence with which theology and social theory is written. I think it has something to do with the fact that I had a Methodist upbringing and my parents before that had been immersed in a kind of holiness tradition that your your whole life should be infused by Christianity and so I never I never felt entirely comfortable with the going through various processes of a secular education I always wanted to to know well okay what's this for what's the big vision you know what what's this telling us about ultimate reality or why we're here in the universe so that i i was often i was often i think bored and rebellious um through most of my formal education and um and feeling that i remember when i was at oxford and we did the history of political thought paper and i remember feeling shocked that there was a kind of assumption here that basically negative dark evil things or petty things were the fundamental human realities <laughs> you know whether reading sort of machiavelli hobbes Locke, or in all these cases it, it, as if sort of secular social thought somehow begins with very negative premises that you might want to argue the realistic but i'm not so sure about that uh, i think they're only half realistic Secular society, John Milbank concluded, was founded on a myth of violence. But he believed, as you'll hear, that peace was the primary reality, that the world, though fallen, still has its source in an overflowing goodness. He wrote Theology and Social Theory to vindicate this belief and to show that modern secular thought has no better claim on us than the traditional Christian view. He found a kindred spirit in a young doctoral student at Cambridge named Catherine Pickstock. Her subject was liturgy, 
the rituals by which the church embodies and enacts its faith. She too was working on a root and branch critique of secular society, and she had just written her own manifesto against secularism in the form of what she now calls a juvenile article. It was at this point that she encountered John Milbank, as she told me when we met recently at her office at Emmanuel College, Cambridge. I met John shortly after having written my juvenile article, and I had a, a different supervisor who was much more of a straightforward liturgist, and I think he was probably pretty bewildered by the work I was doing, and I think he was expecting something rather more along the lines of historical manuscript work. And then I produced this rather dogmatic essay all about the abyss of modernity and so forth. And I met John Milbank shortly after that at a seminar and discussed my work with him and realised that he would be um, a rather superior interlocutor from, from my point of view. And so he then became my doctoral supervisor. And I think the liturgist was relieved um, to have me off his books um, since I was just a source of puzzlement to him. So uh, that's when I met John and um, we found all sorts of work and ideas that we had in common. The work that Catherine Pickstock did under John Milbank's supervision was published in 1998 under the title After Writing on the Liturgical Consummation of Philosophy. This book became the second founding text of Radical Orthodoxy, and you'll hear more about its mysterious title presently. John Milbeck and Catherine Pickstock also found others in Cambridge who shared their desire to take theology back to its pre-modern roots. Through their meetings, Radical Orthodoxy took shape as a movement. Rutledge published an anthology called Radical Orthodoxy in 1999, and then followed with a series of 12 more books under that general title. There were conferences, and there was controversy, provoked in part by what opponents perceived as the rather dogmatic tone of some of the movement's pronouncements. Radical Orthodoxy argues, to put it very simply, that the modern world has lost its way because it has lost its living connection with the divine. We have fallen into thinking that everything around us is ours, to dominate, to consume, to understand. And in the process, Catherine Pickstock says, we have lost touch with what she calls transcendence. Transcendence is the word to describe a reality which is beyond all categories. It's, all, it's beyond all dichotomies, beyond all understandings of thing that we have. So, for example, where we see a thing as having boundaries, as having a place, as having a certain kind of temporality. Transcendence is beyond all of those things. It's beyond here and there, near and far, limit and unlimit, or unlimitedness. Transcendence is simply beyond every definition, which isn't to say it's formless or like a big mess. Um, it, it is unity itself, but unity conceived as beyond being. I think beyond being is perhaps the most useful way of thinking of it, although one could also say, as Plato said of the good, that it's unsayable. It, it simply can't be reached in words. So if you think of reality as a kind of hierarchy for a moment and you put transcendence at the top of the hierarchy and you have on the lower rungs of the hierarchy all forms of reality right down to ants and ants legs and so forth although transcendence according to this picture is right at the top equally it is just as present to the ants legs as it is to the angels and the priests and the bishops and so forth it's both at the top and at the bottom there simply isn't a place where transcendence cannot be because it is transcendent, it is beyond all limit, and yet works in and through every limit that we have. The divine, in Catherine Pickstock's understanding, pervades reality and yet exceeds it. It's both near at hand, in the homeliest elements of our experience, and beyond our reach. 
And because everything participates in God, she says, there is something about each thing that eludes us. If we apprehend a tree as participating in God, we don't see the tree as somehow an end in itself and as somehow laying out as a sort of given thing that we can manipulate. We now receive it as more than itself and as somehow mysterious. It's not a, a given. It becomes something that arrives in a sort of surprising way, one might say. And obviously this is a rather banal example, but if you were to apply that kind of metaphysical structure to the whole of everything one does, it repositions all the things that we otherwise might assume. Now, to me, this is uncontroversial. It's just a traditional theological perspective. But within philosophy from 1300 onwards, that fundamental principle was no longer assumed and came to be exceptional. Catherine Pickstock and her colleagues in radical orthodoxy believe that a philosophical revolution took place around the year 1300. Up to this time, she says, the view that prevailed was the one she just sketched. Everything participates in God, but God is beyond any category we can devise. Thomas Aquinas, who taught in Paris in the years before 1300, says, for example, that God is abundantly displayed for us in the world, but what God is in himself is hidden from us. But in the generation after Aquinas, a theologian at Oxford called Duns Scotus, Duns the Scot, put forward a new argument. Duns said that if the term being is to have any meaning, then it must comprehend all that exists, including God. This may sound innocent enough, but for Pickstock it was a bombshell, because it made God, in a sense, thinkable. And this went along with a second innovation in Duns Scotus's thought. God began to be thought of as a remote and inscrutable will, and no longer as the very breath of everything that exists. One of the things that happened when Duns Scotus and various people following him, particularly William of Ockham, introduced new metaphysical principles was that God was no longer seen as manifest in and through the world, albeit in a mysterious way. God came to be seen as a distant, unknown reality who related to the world through the imposition of his will. So a much more voluntaristic notion of God came to be introduced. And this seems to go hand in hand with an increasingly legalistic notion of political power, an increasingly centralised notion of religious power on earth in various papal structures where power seems to lie at a sort of pinpoint over against a sphere which seems to be laid out flat almost underneath it very different from the much more complex relationships of power envisaged within that overall worldview which held God as mediated in and through everything. But when you get rid of that structure and you have something much simpler with power given in one sort of simple assertion of the will or one divine fiat, everything else seems to be flattened and somehow made more static, if you like. And I suppose that's one of the things that we've traced in various of our works, was ways in which that change can be seen in different spheres of life. The idea of a social and intellectual revolution taking place around the year 1300 unsettles familiar categories. We speak, for example, of the Middle Ages, as if this were just a sleepy interval between the glories of classical civilization and the reawakening of the Renaissance. But radical orthodoxy is not original in locating the first modern revolution at the height of those Middle Ages. Many contemporary historians have traced the roots of modern society back to this period. Radical orthodoxy draws on this work, John Milbank says, 
and puts a special emphasis on how the relationship between God and the world was being reimagined at this time. People sense that the cosmos is a huge book of signs pointing us towards God starts to erode. And instead, especially at the intellectual level, people start to think that the world is simply a set of contingent arrangements, a series of facts joined together almost randomly, so that they they lose the sense that there are any sort of intrinsic necessities in things. And it's as if this is a hair's breadth away from a kind of nihilism, but it's not nihilism because, of course, the view is that the way things are is an arrangement chosen by God, chosen by the fiat of God's will. This can still be thought of as, you know, a loving will. It's important not to exaggerate here, but the stress now is more on God's inscrutable will. There's less idea that we have sort of insight into the inner life of God. God's inscrutable will, God as almighty power. It's as if you... Um, you can no longer read off from the cosmos the nature of God. You can have the bare sense that, yes, this is created by God. But you could now fully know what things are in finite terms without reference to God. You can say, you can fully describe things without reference to God. You can say, well, there is all this, and sure, it was made by God. But the fact that it was made by God doesn't seem to mark things any longer. John Milbank is speaking here of changes which will unfold over centuries, which are perhaps still unfolding today, but whose origins can all be found in the years leading up to 1300. These changes were once summed up for me in a single image by Ivan Illich, a thinker who shares much in common with radical orthodoxy. The world, Illich said, falls from the hands of God into the hands of humanity. The church is transformed from an otherworldly community into something that begins to look, in its legal and bureaucratic apparatus, more like a modern state. Formal contract increasingly replaces more informal bonds between people. The world begins to open itself to scientific study and technological manipulation in a new way. Law becomes the primary metaphor of God's rule. In this emerging modern world, according to John Milbank, faith is no longer seen as having its roots in the very nature of things. Faith and reason divide. And this is a view, Milbank says, that has recently received support from a surprising quarter. Our analysis is in fact shared by Pope Benedict in his Regensburg address. Nothing could be clearer than that he has the same analysis, because he's saying that you get from 1300 onwards a rupture between faith and reason, that reason becomes drained of any mystery, and faith becomes something that you less and less have a kind of rational insight into. It's just a deliverance of authority, if you like. So what the Pope is diagnosing here, I think with great profundity, is that there is a deep connection between what theologians usually call videism, you know, the sense we just rely on faith, the, this kind of authoritarian religion on the one hand, and uh, a thinned down rationalism on the other hand. So what the Pope is saying in a way is, we shouldn't be surprised if extreme religion has come back in a world dominated by rationalism, that this picture is already set going in the late Middle Ages, and that the, the problem is the divorce between faith and reason. John Milbank and Pope Benedict see the divorce between faith and reason as virtually the founding event of the modern world. Faith became an act of will, and reason was left to explore the world 
as it were, outside of God. Nature was deprived of that mysterious excess of meaning that had come from its participation in the divine. The world was increasingly, as Catherine Pickstock said earlier, laid out flat as if it were a survey or a blueprint. Cut off from God, everything was now seen to possess its own inner code or operating instructions. The visible and extended world of space took on a new importance, while the mysterious order in which things arrive in time became less significant. John Milbank speaks of an imminent spatialization, imminent meaning that things now carry their own meaning rather than receiving it as a gift from God. If you don't see eternity as ultimate and time as the moving image of eternity, as Plato said, you will substitute for eternity an imminent spatialization. In other words, you'll say that time is subordinate to a kind of static spatial grid by which everything can be measured. And then you will lose the importance of things dying and passing away. And you'll, so you'll substitute for real bodies but live and die something like an abstraction. So it would be, I guess a good illustration of this would be the way it's as if the, say, shall we say, the realm of Britain is no longer thought of as composed by living persons, but by sort of the abstract average population that, that's kind of indifferent to people living and passing away. And because people die, but somebody else carries out the same tasks so it's like a big machine that doesn't really change because um, it may superficially appear to change but so if, it's a kind of pseudo eternity it is a pseudo eternity because the purpose of this machine is simply always to sort of just go on increasing in in wealth and what power remains to it and therefore People are sacrificed to that, if you like. People are sacrificed to the secular state. Spatialization is a key idea for radical orthodoxy, and it can be seen as continuing right into our own time, as the world is ever more completely laid out for us. To take just one small example from my own craft of sound editing, the words I used to have to wait to hear as a reel of tape unspooled, now appear before me on a screen, their tiniest nuance made visible and subject to manipulation. Control increases, but surprise and mystery diminish. Because the more the world is known and dominated, Catherine Pickstock says, the more its true vitality escapes us. If you try to hold on to things in the manner of a given reality rather than in the mode of a gift, you lose it all the more, since it is no longer the thing that it was. It dies to us. And so when you try to construct a reality outside a theological vision, all you have are empty trinkets, things that no longer arrive at all. And for that reason, death ends up by default becoming central to everything since you only really truly live when you understand that life and death flow in and out of one another and are repositioned in a context of eternity where time is the moving image of eternity. If we're afraid of death to such an extent that we ensure life with pieces of paper and contracts and signed documents, then it's a fearful kind of life which constantly tries to stockpile certain things in case uncertainty should wield some kind of sway over us. I think if one is afraid of the uncertain or the mysterious or the complicated or things that arrive in, an, in a rather um, fluctuating fashion, and if you try to deny the reality of those things, then one ends up with an artifice which isn't really real. It's rather like a museum exhibit rather than life itself. Catherine Pickstock portrays life in modern secular society as life lived in defiance of death, flux, and surprise. 
And this effort to keep everything pinned down necessarily involves violence, she says. Here again, radical orthodoxy overturns the received wisdom. Secular society is usually seen as having overcome the violence of religion and replaced it with a regime of tolerance and civility. The conflicts that tore Europe apart after the Reformation were called the wars of religion and were seen as a consequence of the unreasonable and intractable nature of religious opinion. Catherine Pickstock is not so sure. I've been much influenced by the work of an American theologian called William Kavanagh, who has written a very influential essay about the wars of religion. And he comments in that essay that it's been so acceptable to see the wars of religion as needing to be quelled by secular reason and that somehow secular reason was the only way that any kind of peace could be established and that religion is of course always going to be the source of the problem but in his essay which is in a journal called Modern Theology he tries to present a different genealogy and he shows that the wars of religion themselves arose because of tensions arising through the introduction of various secular forms of rationality and that there is something inherently violent about secular categories. So in a sense, I suppose if one were to relate this idea to the sort of things I've been talking about, when you try to construct a reality through recourse to human reason alone, you automatically have to do violence to the world because you're deliberately trying to evade the way things really are and impose your own structure upon reality and take that construction as a version of the way things truly, truly are. And so in a sense, I would argue that when you try to deny the perpetual arriving quality and the mysterious nature of reality, you are in a sense, doing violence to reality. So the clarity of language or the supposed access to knowledge in a clear and distinct fashion through various forms of language, it's an artificial clarity. Reality isn't clear. Reality doesn't arrive in little clear bundles ready for us to absorb them in as an efficient manner as possible. At every stage of apprehension of reality, complexity intrudes, whether it is in the way in which reality arrives or whether it's in the way in which we we know it in all our diverse, passionate ways and with all our own finite perspectives and different cares from moment to moment. The link between violence and religion in our world seems almost too obvious to challenge. The evidence, superficially, seems all on the side of the new wave of atheist humanists, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, who insist on the violent and unreasonable character of religious opinion. But Catherine Pickstock asks whether it is religion or secularity that is the actual source of the violence. It was the newly minted secular states of Europe that waged the so-called wars of religion, she says. Part of the difficulty here lies in the slipperiness of the word religion. John Milbank and Catherine Pickstock argue that a profound break separates the first millennium of Christianity from the modern era. If they are right, then religion must mean something quite different before and after this rupture. Religion today, for example, is often taken to refer to nothing more than a private opinion, an option for this or that spirituality, so-called. Radical orthodoxy is talking about something rather different. It wants to renew religion, John Milbank says, as a fully embodied way of life. The church is at once very, very spiritual and very, very concrete, the church continues that sense of the incarnation. And I mean that 
quite literally that the church is a communion of souls it extends to another world but it's also the material practices it's also physical churches it's also sacred sites it's also the continuous sacralization of space it's also parish boundaries i mean i'm i believe in all this fantastic stuff i'm really bitterly opposed to kind of the disenchantment uh, that is dominant in the modern churches including i think amongst most evangelicals like i mean recently in the nottingham diocese you know a radio show wanted somebody to come and talk about angels so the clergy and this is a very evangelical diet. They sent around the circular saying, is there anybody around who still believes in angels enough to talk about this? And in, in my view, this is scandalous. They shouldn't even be ordained if they can't give a cogent account of the angelic and, and its place in the divine economy. I want everything put back again, uh, in one sense. <laughs> you know, I believe in the lot pilgrimages you know everything um the importance of sacred sites the traditions about the unseen even about the being other creatures hidden within the dimensions of this world are traditions that i think we should take seriously and that that, that uh, exist in many many different traditions and I, I think i think one of our problems is that we have the wrong idea about monotheism yet you know that um of course there are gods and angels and spirits and and what have you in incredible plurality the point about the divine unity is that it's beyond all that monotheism is not denying the gods um, I think it's important to see that and that the most radical monotheists have always seen that you know, there are many spiritual powers, and there may be some poise between the good and the bad, as, you know, the early Irish theologians acknowledge. Who knows? The point is that the supreme God is one, in a sense, that transcends any of that kind of thing. So, so for me, yeah, the church is supremely concrete and supremely spiritual, and I think that um, there's a sense in which, in a fallen world, corporeality can sort of lead us into despair it's a site of decay and so on and we can only not despair if corporeality itself is restored so without the incarnation and without the resurrection we're not really going to fully uh, value embodiment as glorious as john milbank's emphasis on embodiment suggests radical orthodoxy is in its own way a political movement. Indeed, a movement beyond secular reason could hardly be anything else. Secular reason pretty much defines contemporary politics, so any move to question its validity must involve, among other things, a profound redefinition of political community. For John Milbank, the alternative to a secular political space is an expanded idea of what constitutes the church. I'm very much in a tradition of Anglican thinkers going back to John Neville Figgis who've insisted that the church is the purpose of salvation. It's not just the collection of believers or the saved. The church is the realization of salvation because the church is the realization of reconciliation ultimately between everybody. You know, ultimately the church is as the Eastern Orthodox stress bigger than the cosmos, you know, because it's the cosmos linked to God and return to God so that church for me is a very big reality it's the site of the true human sociality so again very much in the tradition of Anglican socialism I tend to see the church itself as the political vehicle you know you don't need a Christian political party because the church has a social purpose that goes beyond the political understood in the normal sense because it's not just about equal sharing and punishing wrongdoers it's about forgiveness and reconciliation restoring and giving super abundantly to each other so it involves some kind of social purpose that can't be fully realized in this world but can to some extent and goes beyond the the social purpose and political purpose of the state so much so even that 
ideally state functions to my mind should be minimalized in relation to ecclesiastical functions you know the more the more we had real church in our economic practices in our um social practices of charity and so on the less you would need the state functions so that liturgy also is crucial for me here and again Catherine I think is responsible for that the sense that worshipping God is the true social purpose and and that everything all our um, economic activities are, are, are ordained ultimately orientated to you know making true worship of God in the kind of ritual patterns of our daily life that you know come to a head in what happens in a, in a church and I don't think this is airy fairy on the contrary a a recent British government report said that, you know, only people who go to church are sustaining village life nowadays, you know. It's the people who go to church who run the local history society and the discussion clubs and the women's institutes and, you know, because without a sense of what binds us together, you don't have a real society. Do you and, think there are a lot of people who don't go to church who belong to that enlarged sense absolutely. of church in our time? There's no question that I think that, yeah, because everybody who does something good belongs to the cosmic church, if you like, and um, I, I'm not questioning that at all, but I do think that um, without explicit religion, you do see a degeneration in people's attitudes. I, I think you can see it in Britain quite clearly, actually. And I think in very concrete terms that radical orthodoxy is committed to a defence of the parish against the common trends of the now evangelical dominated Church of England. They they have this idea that the parish is less important and that we ought to have um, networks of bodybuilders and skateboarders and God knows what, you know. And this is blasphemy because it denies the sense that you're in the church just because you're a person. You know, the, the church is the only place where people arrive simply because they're people. Skateboarders are going to stop skateboarding. And uh, um, the point is that the church is people are uniting as people and um, people with different vocations forming the body of Christ, not because they're kind of networks of um, people with a particular kind of um, inclination or or specialization but also i think this is badly sociologically wrong that in the postmodern village and i live in a postmodern village Southall in nottinghamshire people in fact do meet in real terrain they meet for book clubs and yoga classes all kinds of stuff and they're interested in real space um, they're not simply dormitory villages. This is completely wrong. And, and therefore, there's a huge opportunity for the church in the postmodern village because there is a sense in which, once again, people are looking for something like the church to bind things together again. And the idea of the parish is crucially non-sectarian. The priest is serving everybody who lives in this place um, everybody is inside the church already if you like john milbank sees the church as an encompassing and ultimately cosmic community and this view is complemented as he just said by the emphasis in catherine pickstock's work on liturgy liturgy in its basic meaning refers to the order of words and actions that is prescribed for public worship but in her book, After Writing, Catherine Pickstock has given the term a much enlarged sense. She argues that the muddles and uncertainties in which modern philosophy has ended up can only be overcome by recognizing that language finally fulfills itself only in praise and celebration, that is, in liturgy. And so she subtitled her book, On the Liturgical Consummation of Philosophy. In my subtitle, I was trying to hint at the ultimate argument of my book, which is that 
the spatialization of modernity, as I've described it, could only really be shattered or in some way challenged by a liturgical worldview where one is no longer trying to enthrone one's own constructs but trying to reposition oneself in that broader context which sees the whole of reality as arriving from a divine creative source and that we can only really undo all of these dichotomies by some kind of liturgical enactment. One of the things I did in my book when I was analysing secular reason was to show how the human self by definition is a divided self when it's trying to enthrone its own constructs. It starts to lead an almost duplicitous existence. But a liturgical self is one which acknowledges fully its complete dependence upon another being, a divine transcendent reality, and is so committed to that reality that it can't admit any kind of divisions or internal contradictions. There is something completely simple about liturgical language. It simply says, I am nothing, and I depend upon you, and I worship you. And along with that liturgical worldview comes a a recognition that everything around us is in the mode of gift and arrives as a gift from God. And so not only does it affect our relationship to ourselves and to God himself, but also our relationship to the world around us and how we receive it. Liturgy, as Catherine Pickstock uses the term, signifies an underlying attitude and not just a specific order of celebration. It is, as she says, a way of being on the way, a way of receiving and releasing what is only ever present in passing. Liturgy isn't just uh, uh, going to church on a Sunday. When I was analysing what a liturgical worldview might be like, I tried to conceive it as a way of life rather than as a text or as something we did every now and then. And this is something actually I I found in Plato again um, when he's looking at the life of the philosopher and the philosopher's desire to recollect the highest principles of the good and communicate them to his pupils. He was trying to show that philosophy isn't a decadent pursuit that occurs on the ancient Greek version of a high table in a college, but rather is a way of life where everything must be orientated towards a vision of the good. And if one can Christianize that vision, vision as in a way that's what I've been doing in my analysis of liturgy, is trying to show how a way of life might help us to unsettle all of the dichotomies and categories, pernicious categories that I analysed in secular modernity. Catherine Pickstock gives the word liturgy a wide resonance, but she also devotes many pages of her book after writing to analyzing a specific liturgy, the celebration of the Christian Eucharist, in which the elements of bread and wine are said to become the body and blood of Christ. Drawing particularly on the writings of Thomas Aquinas, she asks how Christ is made present in the Mass. I found that the understanding of presence that you get in Aquinas' understanding of the Eucharist is not the kind of fetishized presence of modernity. It's not one that is somehow enthronable or stockpileable. It's a presence which is mysterious and one which seems to bring the meanings of words together one thing that struck Aquinas about the Eucharist is that although it's the, almost the highest instance of God's action through human action on earth, nevertheless it seems to use the most ordinary objects. It seems to draw upon almost banal objects, which are bread and wine, grape and grain. Nothing could be somehow more local and more summoning of ordinary labour, transport, commerce, all the things that seem ordinarily to take us away from high piety. And one of the things that Aquinas says about the choice of elements is 
precisely their ordinariness and their association with human conviviality and eating and drinking and the good smell of the bread and the wine. Plus, it was significant for him that bread and wine involved human trade and travel and commerce and so forth. And so that the lowest, most ordinary, basic elements of human survival and human operation are brought into this moment of heightened realisation of divine presence. And so for all these different reasons, you can see ways in which we're being reminded in the Eucharist that there isn't really an area of human operation which isn't somehow pre-included within God's gift. And reminded also that liturgy is something which all of human action leads towards and presupposes, if even in the manufacture of bread, we're somehow being led towards a Eucharistic celebration. It helps us to reposition our understanding of all human labour as praise of the divine. And again, this brings us back to the idea that it isn't just something, liturgy isn't just something that we should think about on Sundays or high feast days, but it's something that all our human labours might become, that human labour itself might be liturgy. And so there isn't necessarily a separation between life and liturgy. Even washing up could be offered as a sort of divine praise. All human actions could be. And so equally, if we were to see the tree that I referred to earlier as itself fulfilling its treeness by worshipping God, and this is how Aquinas saw the world around us, all the things that exist are worshipping God in their own way. And so when the tree fulfills its telos as a tree, that moment of fulfilment is the tree's worshipping God or copying God in its own manner. And so a Eucharistic sensibility, if one can talk of such a thing, is one which sees everything as praise of the divine reality. You say that the Eucharist saves the sign. Yes, because in the Eucharistic signs, the sign and the thing coincide, since God is is at once the sign and the thing pointed towards. And it's at that moment that the sign, in a sense, becomes stabilised. There is no presence and absence, since presence is all in all, and everything seems to lead towards this transcendent plenitude. And so insofar as the Eucharistic signs summon all elements of human labour and if doxology or liturgy or praise of the divine is in a sense the highest human language because it's the one that is the least divided then in a sense a Eucharistic moment is one which can bring human language to its highest fulfilment its moment of consummation if you like its moment of being made present to the highest meaning and so the Eucharistic presence is like a, an intensified moment of what's going on all the time. The Eucharist is in everything. That moment of plenitude is in every moment. But in a liturgical Eucharist, there we see it, in a sense, underlined. It, it sort of reminds us, in a sense, of what's happening at all times. That Eucharistic logic of divine gift. Liturgy, Catherine Pickstock says is the highest human language, because it is the least divided. At the moment of transubstantiation, so-called, when the wine and the bread are called the body and blood of Christ, the sign becomes what it signifies. But this is not a presence that can be preserved, or in Catherine Pickstock's words, stockpiled. It is present only in passing. And because each of us normally lives as a house divided, she says, the liturgy must be repeated. Because we're fallen and finite and flawed, we're always going to be thinking in dichotomies. We're always going to be thinking life versus death and left versus right. So perhaps it is the case that the two visions that Plato articulates in the Phaedrus of a world dominated by sophistry and a world dominated by a vision of the good, perhaps we're always going to be somewhere in between those two extremes. And one moment we can repeatedly worship the divine being and understand what we're trying to do when we do that, but the next moment we'll 
find ourselves right back at the beginning again, trying to construct our realities and mistaking our realities for reality as such. It is probably part of the human condition that we can't understand a theological worldview once and for all. We have to keep trying to renew the vision through liturgical enactment, through endless purifications and trying efforts to re-understand our position. We are destined to repeat this over and over again and try to understand it every moment. Radical orthodoxy has grown out of the recognition that the contemporary world is at an impasse and that it can only go forward by first going back to recover what it has lost. I hope it's clear from what you've heard that this is not, in my view, a reactionary stance. Radical orthodoxy may find its inspiration in pre-modern texts, but it's very much a post-modern movement. It is beginning to dawn on many serious people that the world, as it's presently constituted, has no future. Radical orthodoxy's proposal is a return to what John Milbank calls the future that we have missed by taking the modern secular detour. On Ideas, you've been listening to theologians John Milbank and Catherine Pickstock discussing Radical Orthodoxy, a movement their writings help to inspire. The program was produced and presented by David Cayley, with the assistance of Richard Handler, Dave Field, and Luz Nage. The executive producer of Ideas is Bernie Lucht. I'm Paul Kennedy. To learn more about CBC Radio podcasts, please visit cbc.ca slash podcasting.